Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Strategic Planning and Policy Committee meeting for March. So, a warm welcome to you all. First of all, I'd like to start with a karakia down where if you'd like to do that. Thank you. Tina Quillers. Iti tūtahi, i mihi nui kia koutou e tēnei hui hui, hā ki roto, hā ki waho, kia tau te mauri e kōkiri nei, i ngā piki, mena heke, ko te rangi mārie, taku e rapu nei, ti hei mauri ora. Thank you, Dan Marie. Right, now, do we have any apologies this morning? I note that um, Bill is not here yet, so he may come in later. Otherwise, we're all uh, attendants. Uh, disclosures of members' interest this morning? Anyone want to declare? Lou? Just quickly, um, I am a stakeholder uh, through the RSA for the Memorial Park. Whether that is just... I just want to mention that factor. Okay, thank you, Lou. I think I have an Bruce? like to declare conflict for that item as well, no problem. Claire? Uh, just the item to do with the uh, arts policy and the kaipaka pa po, it's just that I'm on the governance group of Taia to Taia, that's all. I, I don't think it's it's a conflict, but I just I just wanted to disclose it. Okay, thank you, Claire. Are there any other conflicts? No, we'll move through. Are there any late items? Nothing? No. Now, our next item, which is the um, order of the meeting, so we do have a change so that the Strategic Planning and Policy Committee confirm the order of the meeting subject to item 7, consultation of draft schedule of fees and charges, 24-25, being taken as the last item on the agenda for today. Thank you, Susan, and Monty will second. All in favour? Carried. Thank you, everyone, for accommodating that change. Right, we'll move on to the minutes of the meeting on the 7th of February. Are there any changes, amendments? Claire's looking very quiet. I presume that there's nothing. Right, so Councillor Roger will move. Can I have a second to please? Claire will second. All in favour? Aye. Carried. All right, thanks everybody. Okay, okay, we'll move to our very first item, which is the Te Amutu and Kiki Community Board recommendation on the Te Amutu War Memorial Park concept plan. And Brad is going to open this item for us. And we have asked um, Chair of the Te Amutu Community Board, Ange Holt, um, to come and speak to this as well. So Ange, would you like to pop up beside Brad? Hope your back is feeling better. No. <laughs> so if Ange looks like she's in pain, so she has a sore back, everybody. So, <laughs> so my face is down there. All right. Okay, Ed, um, Brad, we'll let you uh, lead that, please. Na mihi o te uh, While I'll take the report as read, for clarity and for the benefit of those attending today, I'll identify some key points of the report. This morning we are seeking direction from the committee as to which course of action to take regarding the Te Amutu uh, Warmer World Park concept plan following a res resolution from the Te Amuru and Kiki Community Board to pause future work until a full review of the concept plan can be conducted. The concept plan was adopted by this committee in June 2021 following a robust consultation process which included Mana Whenua, the RSA, community members, park users and the Te Amuru Community Board. This process followed other similar successful consultation processes such as the, the Te to concept plan, the cemetery concert plans, and most recently, the Leamington Domain Master Plan. Furthermore, the Te Amuru Memorial Park concert plan was a consultation topic during the 2021 to 31 long-term plan process, so this kaupapa has seen plenty of daylight with the community. It's important to note also that significant changes were made to the concept plan following the feedback received through that consultation process. When the concept plan was adopted, staff agreed to work with the interested group, now formed formally or semi-formally as the Te Amuru War Memorial Park Maintenance Group, on the proviso of those members' respective staff decisions and direction. We continue to work with this group and have an amicable relationship with, in particular, the two spokespeople we interact mostly with. This has been evidenced with input sought from the group into the playground renewal design, the heritage maintenance plan, and the vegetation management plan we're currently working through. Our recommendation is to work with the Te Amuru Kiki Community Board to understand their key concerns and then bring the information back to the SPMP. However, I am happy to take any direction the committee sees fit. And I understand that uh, Ange will, will like to talk. Thank you, Brad. Ange. 
Well, tēnā katoa katoa. Thanks, Chair Liz and councillors for providing the opportunity to speak to our resolution. I'd also like to thank staff for providing a comprehensive report. It must have taken quite some time to pull all that information together. I would also like to apologise personally to Brad for not getting back to him in time due to my current work commitments. I had sent a reply, but it was just last week. Board have done this many times, as you all know. Staff have clearly included enough information, including one of my chair reports, for you to get a picture of what we think and where our main issues lay. We are frequently reminded via discussion on conflict of interest, what you say and do in public, meetings and media, that perception is so important. It's about how the communication is perceived. The recent Community Board, board 2.0 review by Dr Stephen Finlay was no exception, and this was a highly stressed point. We as a community board, along with strong support from our community, still perceive that the statement of there has been robust consultation is largely unfounded. To rehash all the reasons why, we'll just go over old ground and not solve the issues at hand. So what are the possible solutions? One, include the people in the community that care about the Memorial Park. They, after all, are a font of knowledge, of history, of where things are, and so much more. Two, include the Te Aumutu and Kihikihi Community Board, as was indicated. I was told by a senior staff member that Community Board would be involved in the final concept plans. Precedent was set when I was invited to the December 2022 workshop discussing the first heritage plan, vegetation plan, and draft playground. That meeting, from our perspective, went well. In fact, a suggestion we made, which came from members of the Memorial Park Group, was taken on board and created a safer option for access off the bridge into the playground. However, this was the first and last time we had any input. Let us advocate for our community. Three, bring people together so we do not create factions and misunderstandings by keeping groups separate from each other. Lay our cards on the table together, find where we can compromise, where we can bring our strengths together and create a space that we are all proud of. We, sorry, as a community board, have been accused of being polarised by the Memorial Park issue. We would say we were advocating strongly for our community. This park is so important to many people. These people who care have come to us expressing their concerns over what is proposed, how much it is going to cost, what changes are going to be made. It is not just the Te Awamutu War Memorial Maintenance Group. These are people from all over our community. It matters to them, it matters to us. There are other people in the community that would not even know about the park, but as long as there is one to walk around, the rest is of no significance to them as they do not have the same connection. They will be happy with the outcome regardless. Our point is we need to listen to the people who are passionate, who will get in and help, who will provide feedback, who will help us shape our spaces. If we get on side with these people, they say good things, they feel good, they feel included, they feel like they helped shape their space. Isn't this what we aspire to? They become our council's biggest advocates. By engaging with the people who want to participate, you can learn so much. This flow on affects money saving opportunities, better ways of doing things, access to knowledge that consultants and contractors have no knowledge of. A quick example of this was just last week, one of the Memorial Park group was watching the playground work luckily chose to signal the contractor in charge, even though they're not supposed to interact with them, to let them know that the digger was approaching pipework from the fountain. The contractor was told there had been, sorry, the contractor had been advised there were no pipes there. The park member said, well, I'd go careful, they aren't all over there, there are a bunch here. Fortunately, the contractor took heed and the digger progressed carefully to uncover a bunch of pipes that could have been ripped out in a swipe and added a few thousand to the project costs. Relationships are so important. We started this draft plan in a way that created fear, loss and misunderstandings. People came out fighting, angry and feeling very ignored. 
So much angst, disappointment and frustration could have been avoided if we had listened and acknowledged what was shared with us in the first instance. It has been proven time and time again if people feel heard, feel appreciated and understand why they can accept the disappointment that their idea did not make it. People who are passionate want to get things done and are nearly always small in numbers, but they are invaluable in their knowledge and their desire to share what they know, to get in and make things happen. Let's embrace that. Towns grow and change. We are going to have the opportunity to shape many more new spaces over the coming years. This park is our only historical park. Let's not spend a fortune on it by making massive changes and upsetting so many people. Spend wisely with the support of those who care to keep it looking pristine and telling those important stories for both cultures. So to highlight our key concerns, where is the central spine going and what does it impact? What is being removed to create the new pond and surrounding rockery and paths? What is the plan for the fernery? The order in which the individual projects are undertaken, we believe that the order could add value. For example, if the vegetation plan had been completed prior to the playground, any significant work that may be required between the lake and the stream could have been done with bigger cost-saving machinery. Now that will be impossible due to the layout of the new playground, and it's going to be an added cost at some stage. If a number of the smaller, less expensive projects had been at the start, we could have seen some notable improvements for a relatively small cost. The valuable storytelling opportunities are not prioritised and are still possibly years away. Most importantly, though, the stakeholders just want to have the opportunity to engage and have some say in the outcomes before it is too late to make any changes. That the parts of the park that are important are retained or there are, at very least, clear and well-founded reasons why a change is needed. The community board embraces the opportunity to find solutions so we can move forward in a unified manner and save time and money by not requiring a full review, which I understand would be a significant cost to ratepayers and added work for staff. So in light of this, we would like to support option two on the condition that it is modified to include that all key stakeholders as identified, Te Aumutu and Kiki Community Board, the War Memorial Park Maintenance Group, Netball Club and RSA, along with our partner Mana Whenua, may attend slash are included in discussions that relate to changes in the Te Aumutu War Memorial Park, including the finalisation of concept plans. And two, that all interested parties have the opportunity to come together to hear each other's views and aspirations for the Te Aumutu War Memorial Park as soon as possible before any other major projects are undertaken. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Ange. You're allowed to clap. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was very well said, actually, Ange. That, um, yeah, it resonated with a lot of us, I'm sure. Hey, and I'd just like to acknowledge your passion for this project, and I, and I know this has not been an easy um, role that you've taken within the community board to lead, you know, the, the changes and the consultation and obviously you've been listening well to the community. So just acknowledge the hard work and the effort that you've put into this already. Okay. Um, Brad, did you have any comments that you wanted to make? Uh, I'll just make a couple of clarifications just in light of what's just, what's just been said. Um, firstly, the, the concept plan is finalised. That was adopted on the in June 2021. Um, so what we're now working through with those stakeholders and, and our partners is the detailed design and, and the what next. Sorry, my missed thing on what I called it. So that's what I meant, the detail. Sorry, so can I, hang on. So can I clarify, my terminology was incorrect there. I mean the detail plans. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. that's good, Angela. No Sorry, problem. thank you. Um, and, and also as an example of us working with um, the, the various stakeholders and, and mana whenua, um, you know, we, we did have that around the playground renewal process, we did have an input meeting, so they everyone provide the input as a result of that. Um, we've taken on board the feedback around the footpath and how that comes through the park off the bridge, um, using stairs and, and, and a chicane system, as well as making sure that it's, an, it's a natural looking feel to the playground as well, and not just a whole lot of plastic dumped in one spot. 
Um, and just to clarify on the, on the time frame of the LTP, um, the, the various projects within the concept plan were detailed as part of that plan, which then informed the long-term plan as well. So just working through those projects um, as, as we have been given direction to via that process. Okay, thank you, Brad. All right, the good news is that we all agree, I think that option two is the, is the best recommendation. And when I say we, I'm meaning I'm hearing, um, Ange, that you... Um, support you know that that option two and obviously that's the staff recommendation as well can i check brad please that the, the stakeholders that Ange has mentioned are are going to be included um in any future discussions and stakeholder engagement the list that she read out is that correct yeah um as, as i said earlier my, my opening address um we have been continuing to work with um the, the stakeholders there and as long as that relationship stays amicable, then we, we're certainly open to that as well. If if there was to be um, a breakdown of that relationship, then we would need to revisit that to make sure that you know staff is, um, from a health and safety point of view, in terms of being looked after. Okay, so the answer is yes. All the all the people that Ange went through. The, my other question is the um, the list of issues that are still outstanding that. And she's mentioned those. All of those issues will be um, included in the next meeting. I think it, when we have our next meeting, it will be good to go through the timeline of just and be very clear around what is and isn't in the park. I think there's continued to be some uh, misinformation around, and so I think it'd be a good opportunity to really clarify what is and isn't in the concept plan, and then also provide that timeline of of when those projects are scheduled for the long term plan or where they are. In, in the process. Okay, all right, no, thank you, Brad. Okay, we'll open up the floor for questions. So we've got Bill and then Marcus. Kia ora koutou. Uh, kia ora Ange for that. Um, I just, um, when, I don't have a problem with option two, to be honest, um, because we should consult. Um, there's no problems with that. Um, I am interested to know the key stakeholders who is who that's referring to. Um, because in the recommendation from the Te Kiki Community Board, it talks about uh, mana whenua, the RSA Community Board, next of kin. Not sure who that is. No, this is this is, this is our report. Oh, yeah. Um, and the Memorial Park Maintenance Committee and other affected parties. So if we're talking stakeholders, um, just who are we talking about? Because I, I, I suspect that the next of kin, having been part of this for some time, could well be those that are represented in the in the wall, the RSA wall. Um, and I do wonder about it being at, at no cost if those are the people that we're expected to consult with in terms of the stakeholder group. Okay. So to clarify that, Brad, if you could provide a list um, of who those key stakeholders are, um, if you can send that through to me. Um, and then, yeah, I'd just like to have, take a look at that and then we can um, circulate it. Thanks, Brad. Shall we, thank you. Okay, thank you, Bill. Uh, Marcus, and then Andrew, and then Claire. Um, this project has gone through a really substantial um, process for the planning and, and everything, and it's gone through a long-term planning process, and it's been out to the community. Um, and I, I, I can't support option two at the moment because that's just going to reopen it up for more consultation and... We're going to be spending more money. And I'd like to highlight some of the disadvantages of option two that say staff resource required to facilitate ongoing discussions, which will take away from the ability to prioritise other key work and may result in the need to undertake further consultation with the wider community if the amendment for the concept plan is required. It's, I mean, we this has been through a really sound process and the people that I talk to in the majority of the community think it's a great plan. And it's really ideal. If we go through this, we're going to be spending more money, more council time on it. And I, I just, I, I, I just don't see the point. Sorry, I, I just don't. Okay, thank you, Marcus. Andrew. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks through you, Liz. Um, hmm. uh, look, I, I, I pick off on Marcus's point. I mean, it, it this has gone through. A substantial process, um, and and I believe it was done as well as it could be done by the staff and con um, consultants engaged at the time. 
clearly what has happened is that people with a passionate interest in the park did not pick up on the fact that this, this was happening. Um, and look, it's, it's, it's no point good pointing blame. It's, I'm not blaming that group or I'm, and I'm not blaming Brad and his team. It, it's just happened. And I, look, I know from my own experience um, before I became a councillor, what happened in, you know, round this table and around, I honestly took very little notice of. I just carried on with my little life and did what I wanted and, and stuff was provided for me to, to do that and it, was, and it was great. But we have a group of people who I'm assuming, you know, that's how they carried on their lives and have suddenly realised that something that they are really passionate about has, has been, um, being, well, I'm going to say enhanced and improved. Um, so they want to be heard. Now, look, I, I take Marcus's point, but I also do not want to have a group of people in our community who feel that they are being ignored about something that's really important to them. Um, I just want to be really clear that, in my view, staff and consultants have done all that they could be expected to do in the initial part of this um, engagement process and developing of the plan. Having said all that, I support option two because I do want these, you know, people who are passionate about this park to have an opportunity um, to, to, to have a, a genuine input. Um, and I would like to be a part of any meeting that takes place, if that's possible, please. Thank you, Andrew. I agree with all of those comments. Claire. Um, yes, thank you. And um, thank you, Ange, for coming and presenting today um, um, to pass on, you know, the community board's view and, as you said, you're advocating for your community. I do support the option two. Um, just listening to um, other councillors, I, I'm on a different view about the original um, proposal that was put out. I don't think it did uh, justice to the memorial side of, of the Tiomutu War Memorial Park. Okay, that first concept plan didn't even mention anything about a war memorial um, and the fact that the features in the park were themselves memorials. So I actually would like to apologise to the community that that was what was the first uh, concept that was put out there. And I think that has been the source of a lot of the, um, I suppose, yeah, emotive um, reaction to it. I agree, though, that we acknowledge that it wasn't um, ideal how that played out, but that now we are looking to see people come together, um, improve relationships. And you've said that, you know, you're really keen to see people working together on it. And I really applaud you for that. Um, and I acknowledge all the hard work that staff have put in as well to try and make this work as well. I'm actually quite excited about the concept plan and the, the great, um, I suppose, yeah, the, the design and, and, and what's trying to be created there or improved on or whatever. Um, but I, I do think that we do need to listen to the community and try and give them an, uh, you know, an opportunity to come together and um, yeah, find a way forward. And so, yeah, I, I do support option two as it stands, even though it may well be a bit more expensive, but I think it's really important for those ongoing relationships. Thank you, Claire. Um, we've got Roger and then Dale Marie. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Ange. Thanks, Brad. And this is more a point of clarification for me from your two opening addresses. The, I think what you've inferred is that there's a concept plan but then the, some of the finer detail of that concept plan, as the plan is implemented, then there is some further definition of what exactly happens. And in fact, practically, that is what has happened, even 
to this point where we are now. There have been some changes that everybody agrees, both both sides, that yes, that was a good idea for that to occur. So that's why I support this, that it's not necessarily saying that the concept plan is ditched. Definitely not. The concept plan's there. But opening up that communication to say, well, look, as we go down, this aspect of the plan, we've got to work out how it's going to be done. Yes, and let's get that consultation with the community to find out how that can be done effectively. Am I right in that? You know, you're, you're exactly right there, um, Councillor Gordon. Um, the concept plan is just that. Following concept plans, we then do detailed designs and um, and the implementation process. Yep. So it's at that point in time that we then seek further input from those interested in that particular kopapa, and then we um, essentially carry out the project. Um, and so, yeah, that is yeah. Your summary is right. Good, thank you. I therefore su support this uh, option, two. option two very much. Yeah. Thank you, Roger. Dale Marie. I'm just going to take us back to Karakia. Haki roto, haki waho, kia tauti mauri i kōkiri nei. I ngā piki, mena hike. Ko te rangi mārie, taku e rapu nei. Tihei mauri ora. I think this is a great opportunity for us, as treaty partners, to look at a way forward progressively. Because I think option two is going to put us into a place where we've identified to everybody, there's been a lot of identifying of the gaps and probably where Maybe each side of us went wrong in certain ways. And we've discussed this a lot. So I'm going to take it back to that karakia, because I'm in support of, of option two, as long as that's the way that we all want to go from the community. Um, I'm really keen to see that list of um, stakeholders, and I'm keen to put my hand up to keep supporting the relationship work to go forward and help our staff, as, lot, as well as the, the community board, to look at how we foster these relationships going forward with this plan. Um, we can talk about all the gaps and, and go back and thrash it out, how things haven't happened, but we need to get a way forward. We have an impasse that is not cool for our community. So putting my hand up to do some more mahi, remember that karakia, because that will keep us going really well today. Kia ora tato. Thank you, um, Dale Marie. Now, oh, are you wanting to speak, Mike? Okay, all right, sorry. I don't think you're allowed to speak, sorry. Oh dear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so look, um, being, um, Chair Liz, can yes. I just ask a quick question, which is slightly sidetracked, but both of these two gentlemen are our council advocates as community board members, and they're not allowed to participate. Is there something wrong with the process? Um, no, 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 they, they, no, no. I they, know because they have a com they've declared a conflict. No, they have right? chosen. They have chosen. It is, it is up to them to Doesn't choose. It? But I thought they were just advising, or you, you were choosing not to participate. They were. They were. Yes. Yeah, I, I just feel strongly that I represent the RSA. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. So that is my priority job. Yep. Right, at all times as a stakeholder. Okay, what I do here as a okay. councillor is, is quite separate from being, as I say, a stakeholder. Yep. Okay. Uh, the only thing I'd like to say is I agree with all, all, everything that's going on, and I do think that all the just what would activate, you know, the consultations. That's all. Mm. Right. Okay. All right. Hey, so look, we're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it there. I think that um, I'm going to put the recommendation because I feel very shortly. I will let you speak before we put the recommendation. Um, Susan, do you want to talk now? And then uh, I've got a couple of other things to say. Yeah. Look, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the supporters in the in the gallery today. Um, I know most of you, and you've written to me on various occasions throughout the last few years. So, acknowledge your passion, and obviously, um, Ange and the community board. Thank you for um, for pushing um, this uh, to the fore as you have done, and certainly your your passion can't be um, questioned. Um, uh, in terms of the um, options before us, I, I, I support. Recommendation, uh, the recommendation um, is set out in option two. Uh, however, that comes with a caveat that I would be really anxious if we spent 
money going back and consulting in terms of amendments to the concept plan. I, I don't believe that that is something that um, when you unpack it all and you sit around the table, you realise it's what you want. You, 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 your crew want to have impact in terms of that detailed design. So look, I have some comfort supporting option two with in the back of my mind feeling that that concept plan itself, um, hopefully touch wood, would not be um, uh, revisited because that is, uh, is, would be costly and it detracts from the end game um, that you want a park that everybody can use and love and enjoy for whatever it means to you all. So uh, look, I, I'll support option two with that little caveat in the back of my mind, but yeah, acknowledge the passion that the subject um, uh, arouses in, in all of you in all the different ways. So thank you for coming today. Thanks, Susan. Okay, so the only other thing, um, I'm just noting Andrew's um, interest in attending um, that meeting. I would also like, I would like it um, chaired by, I, well, we need to find out, I think it needs to be a senior elected member. I think that uh, moving forward, I'd like to see better relationships and ensure that we run a really robust process around that. So I think um, me, Susan, Andrew, myself, Claire, let's just have a discussion as to how we might chair that, um, that meeting. I think it's really important we get that right. Dale Marie, really interested in your um, you know, assistance in that space as well. So we have a recommendation on page 15, A through to F. Um, I'll put the recommendation uh, to the elected members. All those in favour? Against? Marcus? Okay, now I don't, who, yeah, so I've, we've, we've got a mover. Mm -hmm. Who is going to move that? Sorry, I didn't do that, but. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll... okay, so Claire will move, Andrew will second, all in favour? No. Sorry, Liz, is this about um, chairing the meeting? No. Oh. Yeah. Resolution, the recommendation oh, that's in the paper, A yeah. through to F. Yeah. Sorry, and I was, I've was i muddled this too. So, yeah, as I said, we've got a mover and a seconder. All in favour? Against? Marcus? You want that recorded? The recommendation is carried. Okay. So we, Brad and I will, um, yeah, we've got a couple of little things to do and we'll be in touch with uh, stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right, um, we'll move on to our next item. As mentioned, we are moving the uh, draft schedule of fees and charges to the end of the day. So we will move now to our Waipa District Council Community Recovery Fund. Gina, who is here? And Sally. <laughs> right, let's just take a second. I have to get my... Uh... Okay, hand it over to you, Gina. Thank you. Morena Koto, so nice to see everybody. So just um, here just to present the report um, the COVID, for the COVID recovery. So um, just briefly, um, back in September 2022, we allocated um, funds to support the recovery um, of the community post-COVID. So um, at that time, we did talk about potentially having another round of public funding um, with what was left in that fund. But um, as sort of stated throughout the report, things obviously have changed a lot in terms of the um, COVID and the way that it is managed and the outcomes of that now. So our recommendation is that the $100,213 remaining in that fund go back into the council budget. So... Um, I'll take the report as being read from there, and if anyone has any questions, we're happy to, happy to chat. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Um, just re reflecting this morning, of course, we're coming up to our um, in anniversary of our first lockdown on the March the 20th. So, um, in fact, yeah, it's something that, although it happened a few years ago, um, brings back a lot of nostalgia and... Yeah, and I, and I and I feel very very lucky actually as a country, um, you know, that we were able to, um, well, very few loss of lives, acknowledge those that obviously um, did, but we were very lucky as a country, compared to many many others. 
Right, so we have a recommendation um, in, in front of us. I'll ask, open it up for questions uh, to Gina. Oh, I was just going to move Susan. it. Susan. I'm, I'm all for, I'm all for <laughs> taking uh, 100,000 100, odd yeah. back into uh, council budgets, just saying. Okay. <laughs> and also acknowledging the great work that's been done by the community groups in the interim. Um, in particular, I did notice a couple that were really obviously top big favourites of mine. Um, um, but look, yeah, a lot of great, uh, those funds were used really uh, wisely. Um, and, um, and I'm hoping that um, we never have to pull together a fund like that ever again. But yeah, I'm happy to move. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Susan. And Monty has asked to second that motion. Are there any other questions before I put it? More comments? No? Okay. Um, mover and a seconder. All in favour? Against? Carried. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> okay, everybody, we're just going to take a quick break. Um, we'll just wait for Anne to come into the room. Just, just two minutes. Hopefully she's not far away. Sorry. Sorry, Brad. Right, we'll carry on. If you'd like to he head back to the hot seat, we'll do the Arts Policy Public Art Acquisition. Yeah. Okay, Brad. Let's make a let's make a start. Um, arts policy. So uh, we. Um, so uh, yes, uh, Anne's uh, apology today. Um, so I will will take the report as read with two highlights. Um, or key, key points. Um, the, the, in the report, I just want to make a clarification um, where we've got the, the budget being funded by uh, Ngāte Pakura. Um, the, while that might be the case, that originally was funded through the project for the water treatment um, station and, and bringing water through a TA. So um, that's how that mechanism did come about. Um, and secondly, uh, we did take this um, kaupapa to the Te Amuru Community Board, Te Amuru and Kiki Community Board last week. Um, and sought their feedback, and there was some feedback provided, which included just making sure that the site, um, especially on the on the banks of the Mangohoi stream, there wasn't prone to erosion. Um, so we went back and, and just double checked that, and, and we're confident that the site chosen is actually still, uh, you know, is is, is robust. Um, that particular stretch is uh, low risk, nice and straight, and well vegetated, so um, risk is very minimal there. Um, otherwise, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions that I can answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brad. Okay, um, clear. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm really excited about it. I mean, I, I did mention that I'm involved in the Taia to Taio project as a, as a governance level, but um, it's great to see, you know, like a, a visible marker, I guess, for the, you know, that, that um, Māori heritage, I guess. I did want to clarify the location of Kaipakapā because we've always sort of it's always come up when we've talked about the War Memorial Park, you know, sort of further along. But um, the, I don't know if Bill or, or someone could just mention, like, the, the, the like, it's not actually where the Po is. It's, it's more likely to be a bit further north and west or something. Yeah, if you could just, yeah. Bill, appreciate that. Kia ora koutou. Um, just uh, yeah, a couple of things here. Is it um, things bred? for step, stepping in for Anne, and, and uh, thanks for the um, support for um, this project. Uh, I think that uh, the signposting along the along the rivers has, by um, Taio to Taio has been actually um, before the council before. Uh, when we sought to get gain, gain um, uh, national funding for the for the whole project, um, which was uh, the inclusive of seven of the <laughs> po. Um, recognising sites along the river, um, there are, uh, you know, a number of those that aren't even accessible um, to the Waipa district uh, public, uh, public or the Waipa district uh, community at this present point in time. Um, so we've actually gone about placing these po where, um, you know, we can where where people can see them. Um, and in some instances, you know, with the hope that um, eventually the cycleway um, that's being done along the river as well, 
uh, we'll we'll pick these up with with QR, QR codes, um, exactly the same way as um, Te Arawai Journeys um, has done, and that will recognise the history that's on that map over there, by the way, <laughs> that you, we sit in the room with all of the time. And I think Kaipak has been identified in there. Uh, but I also wanted to say that um, the the Po have been um, uh, uh, determined by the Mana Whenua Group on Tataio Tataio. Um, and recognising fire, fire Hazel that's here, Kia ora fire, fire Hazel, um, who's on that Mana Whenua group with me, um, Tom Raw, um, and a few others. Um, I can't remember us all at this point in time, but um, uh, suffice to say that it's every, every one of the Mana Whenua along uh, that are connected to the Waipa district. Uh, this, this is an opportunity because uh, we were... Uh, during the environmental and cultural approvals for the, the the water, the water main between Cambridge and Tiamuru, and we have to acknowledge in this our um, our partner in it, um, uh, Karaoke Kahukura, uh, and as part of that process, there was to be art uh, established along that water for that waterway at both ends. So Karaoke Kahukura are doing their end of the river, and uh, and Nati Apakura, um, took responsibility for this end of it. When we when we looked at it, um, this artwork was supposed to have been placed at the water towers at the top of Taylor's Hill. Um, and one of the things that um, the carvers said to us was, well, who's going to see it there? <laughs> Apart from those that live up the top of Taylor's Hill, it's not going to face down the hill for the rest of Tiamudu to see. Um, it's going to be at the top of the hill. Um, so when this uh, artwork poss possibility came up, that placed this artwork in the middle of Tiamudu um, and gave this artwork to all of Tiamudu, um, as well as Mana Whenua, to, to look at and gaze upon. And it's just a, a magnificent piece of artwork done by a very skilled, um, more recent um, uh, um, Māori kawa um, in, a, in a form that will last us uh, for a very long period of time. Um, Ngāti Apakura was supportive of it, and so it fitted the criteria that we needed to connect us in terms of that water waterway between uh, Karaoke Kahukura and ourselves. Um, so, yeah, that's where the support for this artwork comes. It's a beautiful piece. It um, picks up on the wahini, and I haven't yet answered your question, though, <laughs> clear. Um, it picks up on the wahini that not just um, used um, Memorial Park, which is part of the discussion um, that we've just had, but also the wahini, uh, Rangi Aniwa, and Rangiaoni was Ngāti um, uh, Hinatu, and uh, Kaipaka Pā was part of Ngāti Hinatu. It was a Hinatu Pā. But the importance of uh, Rangiaoni is that she was a, an auntie to Pototo Te Whero Whero. Um, and when Pototo Te Whero Whero uh, was first asked to be the Māori king, the first Māori king, um, he was unable to do it because he still had Utu with, um, with the loss of his... Um, his aunt, uh, Rangi Aniwa, who died at a, a battle between ourselves um, and, um, and, uh, and Wahara at the time. Um, and uh, so that was fixed uh, in the traditional way. Uh, we probably shouldn't talk too much about that, but it was fixed in a very traditional way. Um, and uh, that Rangi Aniwa became very important for both Hinatu and Apakura because it meant... Um, that uh, Waharoa and um, was was to return um, the Finua or some of the Finua that Ngāti Apakura and Hinatu had lost in the battle that that uh, that that occurred that wiped out Kaipakapa, um, and so Kaipakapa uh, is in and behind the race course there. Uh, and if anyone knows where Shane Taruki used to stay, it's in and behind where Shane Taruki used to stay. Uh, is it Wallace? No, it's not Wallace. It's on the hey, Christy, Christy Ave. Yeah in the back of Christy Ave, sitting, sitting alongside um, where, um, uh, sitting alongside where the substation is. Um, so the problem with uh, that is that, uh, of course, the waterway was changed. And Gary probably knows a bit, more, Gary Dyer probably knows a bit more about that than I do. Um, so when you change the waterway, you uh, lost a lot of uh, kaipakapa in that process. Um, so, yeah, those are, so this recognises the loss of that. That pass out as well. Mm. Thank Just, you, Bill. Yeah, does that answer the you. question? <laughs> okay, so we have a, um, a a recommendation 
on page 110 uh, of our agenda. Do I have a move and a second to place? I'm thinking, Bill, you're going to want to move it, are you? Okay, so Bill, would you like to move the recommendation? Dar Marie, would you like to second? Yep, all in favour? Against? Carried. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. All right, we'll move on to our next item. Uh, we've got Gary Knighton in the room, Iwi and Mana Whenua Engagement Matters. Page 140. Morning, Gary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Morena. Councillors, um, look, first of all, just I uh, think it'd be good just to uh, like to acknowledge um, the passing of both Hopai Puki and uh, of Waitaruki, who were both uh, members of Nāui Tōpū uh, and the, the former um, Iwi Consultative Committee, um, both did a lot of work for Mana Whenua in the district. And uh, so it's been a pretty sad month um, February 4 um, for council from that point of view. So yeah, really just wanted to acknowledge their, their passing and, and their contribution uh, to WIPA. So, so following on, uh, firstly, just, just the um, chief exec's KPI uh, with respect to engagement and partnership. Uh, so that's been um, some, some mahi that, that uh, Shane has been um, working on uh, and primarily in the first instance, uh, his, his focus and Dale Marie has been assisting as well. Uh, it was, has been around, uh, I guess, getting mana whenua together and seeing if we can get a collective view from mana whenua about where, um, where this partnership should, uh, should go, what it should look like. So there's been a lot of that. It's, I think it's taken quite a bit of time to get to that point. I think there have been two hui so far uh, that have been um, held, one late November and one uh, just recently in February. Um, and I think, and again, I th correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of the focus has been around partnership. What's the need for partnership? What are the touch points with council? Um, and where um, it really was other aspects of it, like Nawi Torpu, what's the future of that? What should that look like? So. Um, it, it has been a, a slower, I guess, had a slower gestation, but I think it's really important that those mana whenua foundations are built. The next stage of that really is um, mana whenua wanting to build that relationship with elected members. So um, I think probably we'll, we'll, we will want to look to see if we can schedule some hui, well, at least starting in, in, in April, um, getting you around around the table with them. So, um, yeah, so very keen if there's something we need to do to support you around that, let us know if there's any uh, particular training or anything you'd like around that. But I think that, that is a key thing that um, it is about building the relationship before, you know, we, we decide what structures and, and, you know, what, you know how we might do that. It's it's a, it's about having that confidence in, in a partnership. Um, so um, I have noted um, I have noted that we well, we may not deliver uh, the the bulk of of the strategy by um, the beginning of July. Um, However, it just you know it, it really depends how how those meetings come together and and you know it could ease, it could flow from one it, it may take two or three and we'll just need to see how that works from there. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, moving from that, um, just noting the commemorations and uh, the the. Rangiafia commemoration, which was held on the 21st of February, as it always is, uh, the first time that uh, acknowledging Ngāti Apakura, the first time they've ever been hold, able to hold that commemoration on their own land. So uh, that, that was pretty a pretty special day, and her worship spoke there. And uh, um, yeah, very special day, I think, for uh, for Manafenua, for for well, for the for the community, really. 
Um, and moving on to, we, to Araco, so that commemoration uh, will be held on the, so that again, the 160th anniversary, um, uh, second Tuesday the 2nd of April. Now, really encourage as many of you to get along to that as possible. Uh, note that the, 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 this meeting has been shifted to the Wednesday to allow you to do that. Uh, so, um, yeah, really, it, it would um, it would be great for our relationship if, if to get of, as many of you along there as, as possible, it, just to be there uh, and to experience it. But um, um, we'll, I'll give you more details about that um, in, the, in the next week or so. Um, but it is significant uh, that the, the, the has a deed of settlement for that particular grievance, I think, is, is signed. And um, so there will be a ministerial presence there. Um, so it, at the moment, they're, they're planning on two and a half to 3,000 people being there. So it's going to be a fairly, fairly significant event. Um, joint management agreement updates. Um, so uh, Waikato Tainui JMA is probably our most active JMA now, so, and we have a strategic work program that we've agreed there, um, and we're making some pretty good progress there. Um, Mariah Preparedness, so Kathy Shaw is working, has been working there, um, noting we only really have five rural Marae in, in the district. Um, so we, we are looking, hopefully, at knocking off uh, having those preparedness plan plans in place by um, sometime this year. Social procurement as well. I've got you know, Joy uh, is working uh, with the uh, procure with the economic development team at Waikato Tainui around how we might incorporate that, um, and that, and that work works quite well with the anchor institution work that we're doing. So it's trying to uh, look at that social procurement aspect. Um, and sort of come to how we might work together on that. And uh, education and employment, looking at potential for the scholarships, et cetera, um, secondments and the like. Uh, we did put out one um, small scholarship, um, but we haven't uh, had any, we haven't much had much uptake on, on that one at the moment. So we'll, we'll have, I think we need to have a look at that uh, and look at the... Um, I guess look at our, our comms mechanisms to see if we're hitting with the right people. Uh, we left that to work at a tiny to put out, but um, I think we, we do need to have a, a conversation you know, around about basically those how how are we getting getting that information out there. Um, uh, um, to Councillor uh, Councillor Brown and. Uh, and Dale Marie, Andrew Brown, yeah. and Dale Marie and I attended um, basically a, uh, a a pan council hui with Waikato Tainui yesterday, really just to have them um, talk about their priorities for the year and sort of um, how they're approaching government government changes, uh, etc. As well, so that was a a, a useful morning just um, to. Uh, see what's going on there. Um, they introduced their new JMA members, um, Ihaka and Quentin, um, who will be meeting uh, with our, our who will be joining Jackie Collier and uh, Linda Tiaho on the uh, JMA board for um, the WIPA JMA. I think the first meeting there is the 15th of April, 14th or 15th of April. Um, te Nihi Nihi Nui, that's progressing along. Uh, so the former Mani Apoto, uh, former Mani Apoto, um, uh, JMA, um, has a, a bit of energy to it now. They're working through with the schedules um, and we're sort of contributing to that as well. So, um, so again, uh, progressing well. Rokoa, not so much happening there. We don't generally hear a lot from Rokoa uh, these days, although we do keep in touch in, term, in, in resource management issues, but uh, they haven't uh, really um, sought uh, a formal JMA meeting for some years now. So um, 
that's happy to take um, happy to take any questions on that. But um, look, also just uh, wanted to note um, I'm moving on. Um, I've uh, taken a position with South Waikato District Council and. Um, We'll be sort of leaving shortly after Easter, and really just wanted to um, just throw my appreciation for everything you've done um, over the last 15 years or so. So, um, yeah, it's been been a great time. But uh, I guess every time, you know, everything there's a new new challenge, and um, sort of looking forward to that as well. Yeah. So thank you for for all your uh, help along the years. Oh, look, look, thanks, um, Gary. And look, just to acknowledge uh, the contribution, of course, uh, before we um, ask for questions on the actual item, um, but just to acknowledge your contribution to WIPA. Um, a lot of people don't know, but Gary and I actually go back to our Hamilton City days yeah. too. Uh, so, yeah, we've known each other a long time. So um, absolutely wish you well. I'm sure we'll, we've still got a few weeks to go, but um, wish you well in your new role. Oh, thanks, ma'am. Okay, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll just um, ask for any qu questions and comments on um, this particular agenda item. So, Bill and then Claire. Kia ora. Um, I just I totally endorse what um, Liz has said. Um, we will miss you. Um, yeah, we've had a relationship for a long period of time now through Naibi Torpu and ICC. Um, <clears throat> and the one thing I'd say is, I uh, um, don't think I can say an elected member, but as a, um, a representative of, the, of iwi, um, in that relationship and the role that you play, um, you've always been available. Um, getting back to me last night when I needed to update something for um, today's today's agenda. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, hope to continue in some way, even in your new role, Gary, um, and I'm sure you'll do extremely well like you have here. Thank you. Um, can, I, can I just... I just wanted to pick up on one thing, um, and um, that's in relation, and, and, and I think this is important, Roger, for um, when we talk about um, hapu, iwi, mana whenua, um, and all of those terms, um, we've now got this new term in this report called tinihinihi nui. Now, it, it has a whakapapa, that, but um, Gary talked about former manupoto. Well, manupoto is in, for, is, is in former, so I know, I know that Gary's picked up the difference here. Uh, manupoto continues to exist. Nati, nati manupoto, it should be too, um, continues to exist. But now, because of the treaty settlement process, we've got this other body, because the Crown required a body to be able to get these settlements too. And so the body that was being chosen by Ngāti Manipoto, Veriahu, um, all of those other hapu that form Ngāti Manipoto is Tinehini Nui. So I hope Manipoto as a, as a term isn't lost in all of this, um, and that the, the, the future, the people that come in the future, um, don't forget um, that it is Ngāti Manipoto um, that this settlement relates to, that this relationship that Gary's talking about here relates to, but it doesn't void the relationships that this council <coughs> needs to have with the mana whenua, the hapu, the ahika that exist in this district. And those are all terms that apply to everything that is Māori here in this district. Um, and, you know, it's not a... The definitions change, definitions change. Ahika, the ones that have stayed on, um, we left Kafia, um, but there were th those that stayed on that are also important to this district. And so, yeah, I just wanted to to pick up on that because I've, I've challenged, been challenged a little bit of recent I times myself um, on the settlement. And I know that it was the name was chosen in good stead and I could talk a little bit about how that name came about, again, relating to King Pototo de Fero Fero. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's important that... You know, Manipoto still exists, and we need to understand that Nati Manipoto still exists. Kia ora. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Bill. Okay, we've got Claire and then uh, Dan Wayne. Yeah, thanks. First of all, I'm stunned that you're leaving us, <laughs> uh, Gary. Yeah, like, um, I don't go back as long as far as Liz, but you've been at council all the time. I've, I've been around this table, and you never asked our permission that you could go somewhere <laughs> else. Um, yeah, so I'm quite hurt. A, um, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, wish you all the best, but yeah, certainly um, yeah, acknowledge the fantastic work that you've done. Yeah, yeah, um, and sorry to see been you go. Pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> I, I presume there's a pretty enticing proposition for you at South Waikato. Yeah, um, I just wanted to, like, like I, I feel um, um, mana whenua and iwi relationships are pretty important for council. Um, so. I, I just wanted to talk a bit about your report um, and acknowledge that 
there's a willingness, you know, to, to, you know, get a better relationship going, a closer relationship, but it's going to take time. That resourcing is an issue and all that kind of thing that we've got to be patient, I guess. But I'm open to sort of those um, extra hui and things like that. I mean, we did have quite a good session last Friday, I think it was last Friday, um, at the Don Rowland Centre for Ahuaki. Mm. And, you know, it was great to just be around the table and just hear, you know, what mana whenua partners were were sharing. You know, I, I found that really valuable, actually. Yeah, so hopefully stuff like that will continue and, yeah, yeah it, may, it may take time. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah, it's important yeah. just to have that economy. Yeah, yeah, and you know, like with any relationship, yeah, you do need, need that personal interaction and the availability of people to be around that table is an issue and things like that. So, yeah, it, it will take time, I guess. Um, I wanted to touch on about the opportunities that council can offer um, mana whenua and things like that. I'm pleased to see things like internships and placements, and I know we've also done some apprenticeships, which might not necessarily be um, solely for mana whenua. I do have some concerns around scholarships because, to me, that is funded from rates, mm -hmm. from rates, and you know it's a different formula where you're asking everyone in the community to contribute for that purpose, can, and uh, as opposed to paying for, you know, infrastructure and services and things like that. And it's it's a land tax, it isn't based on income. And so, you know, um, I, I'm i wondering whether or not that's the right model that it might, I'm thinking it might be better to seek the scholarship side of things from a different source, um, but happy to have a conversation about it. Um, I mean, it's a bit disappointing that a scholarship was offered and it wasn't taken up, you know, like, yeah. And so I'm thinking of the people that paid those rates, you know, and and now it's not even being used. So, but really keen to see, um, as I said, internships, placements. I mean, I am pretty excited about the anchor institution approach and part of that will be employment and skill building and, you know, those close relationships either with schools and um, um, I suppose universities or tech, tech places um, and and also mana whenua to feed in from employers, you know, where their needs are, how can we get those um, roles filled within our community, especially from young people. Yeah, but um, really happy to just to have that, that conversation about it. Yeah. A couple of points, the, the scholarship, we put three thousand dollars up, um, which Waikato Tainui we were going to match dollar for dollar. Um, so, it, 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 you know, we didn't feel comfortable in going any higher than that without sort of coming back to you uh, um, around that. Um, but, but again, you know, maybe like you say, we should be looking more at some of those other mechanisms and you know, bringing it in with the anchor institution work as we sort of looked at see how that how we can roll that sort of thing out, so. You clear? Ah, damn Ray. It's do a tahi, kunaira to mihi atu kia koe keiri i tō kaha, i tō mahi, i tēnei wā ki waipā, kunaira to mihi atu kia koe te rangatira no wai roa. Um, I want to thank you heaps for what you've helped me with in so many different ways in my um, short time that I've been around this table. Um, and I know it's not easy working with us at the best of days, but also <laughs> know that it's not easy working, um, having to claw back um, what I believe is where our standing should be as mana whenua in this space. So, kanui to mihi kia koe, Gary. I know that there's been times where I've had to come up to you and, and really, really ask some questions about stuff. But I want to thank you because you've been really helpful for me when I've come in here um, only six, seven months into this stuff. So, um, 
I know Shane's not here to talk to this while he's away at the moment, so I acknowledge um, how much he's put into these um, mm. meetings that we've had with mana whenua. Um, and, and this is not on you, because I know that you have been helping me immensely with this, because there's only been a Māori ward member in this whare for a very short time. So from that space, I want to thank you, Gary, for all that you've done. But I look forward to working with you over at uh, yeah. <laughs> South Waikato as a Raukawa ki Whareipuhunga uh, Panihākua person. And I know that this isn't goodbye. Yeah. Um, and so, ka nui te mihi kia koe te rangatira i, i, i noho mai ki roto i tō whare a waipa. Nei rā te mihi atu kia koe oa. Tēnā koutou. Thank, thank you, Dan. Okay, everybody. Um, are there, is, oh, Philip, yes. Hi, mate. Um, just uh, personally, congratulations on your new role, um, Gary. Um, previously, I was on the community board as an elected yeah. member 14 years ago, so you said 15 years ago, and now the council rep on the community board. So if it's appropriate, just to congratulate you on behalf of the, the current community board, Hamish community board, on your work everything you've done for us. So Thanks, thank Philip. It's been a, been a great time on the community board as well. Well done. Yeah. All righty. Um, so we've got a recommendation to receive the report. Um, Gary Knighton, Bill's going to move that, and Marcus is going to second. All in favour? Carried. All right, everybody, we'll break for morning tea. If we can have everybody um, back here, please, uh, by 25 past...
go back into it. Okay, welcome back everybody to our SPMP meeting for March. And I'd like to welcome Tony. We're on um, the item District Growth Quarterly Report, 1 October to 31 December. Now, I believe Carl Tutte is going to jump and join us by Zoom um, as well. Can't see him yet, but when he gets here, he gets here, I guess. All right, over to you, Tony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I will take the report as read, uh, and I, I suppose I'll just open the floor to questioning um, there. Thanks, Tony, and welcome, David. I see David Topman online. So um, if we've got any questions around this report, we've got a good team to help support. Right, Mike, first question. Yeah, through the Chair, it's really a side issue to this report, but it's around consenting. And just something I heard on the radio this morning around the, the government wanting to fast track certain types of consents, and they were probably really talking um, projects of national significance, but is there anything? Uh, are we? I guess we need to keep track of what their thinkings are here, and I guess if there's any advantage in us being able to piggyback or filter down beyond national projects of significance into some of our major projects that we might be able to put under this umbrella. Any any comments on that? I mean, I only heard it this morning, so if you've got no comment, I totally understand that. Uh, through the chair, um, I believe that part of that fast tracking was around green infrastructure like uh, wind farms, etc. So I believe what's currently under the MPS for highly productive land is that those items are also restricted um, to to make make good on terms of what's going in that development. So I think it's streamlining that process. But David um, is also online, so he might want to be able to touch on the the whole fast track element of that. Morena, morning all. Um, yeah, just to add to what Tony said, it's it's really only an extension of what's already been provided during the time of COVID. Um, you, you might remember the previous government enabled a fast tracking just given the circumstances and the need to kind of enable big infrastructure projects to proceed without too much impediment. So this is really just an extension of that provisionally until they've got new replacement legislation for the RMA. Um, and yeah, it, it is quite limited. I mean, your question about whether it would enable us at a, at a local level to progress some of the big infrastructure projects in our eyes, it may be an avenue, but it's not entirely clear at this stage. Yeah, I hope that's helpful. Thank you, um, David. Okay, we've got questions. Roger, Dalmarie, and then Lou, and then Claire. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, just a couple of questions that I have, if I may. One is under the current major resource consent applications in process. I notice that that Beacon Hill contracting still hasn't been uh, brought to conclusion. That's been in there now for, I had to think, three years. Um, can we not move that to conclusion somehow? Um, I'd just like to see that cleaned up and uh, progressed. I, I hear you, Councillor. Um, it, it is very frustrating. Um, and <clears throat> all I can say is, fingers crossed, we, we're going to get some movement soon on that. Thank you. Okay, so, so that's my, an answer that I get when I don't get an answer. Thank you, David. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Roger, just on that, I think my understanding is um, that there was information required from the applicant, and so we can only move as fast as they are moving. Okay. And the other one is what, um, and I'm not too sure whether it's already gone through, but there was that release, a public release of the information regarding that large solar farm that's going in Rotorangi Road. Um, what's the progress with that? Is that still going ahead and has it gone through resource consent process? Uh, through the chair, I believe only a pre-applications occurred. I, I think that sourced the information they were after, but they haven't lodged anything to my knowledge. 
All right, thank you, yes. Roger. Right, uh, so it was Dale. No, you've you've taken your question. <laughs> so then it was Lou, Claire, and Philip. It's done. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Just quickly, I uh, wanted to announce that they said the coalition government said that they'll make provision of the resource management enabling housing supply and other matters amendment act 2021 discretionary other uh, than mandatory. Would that mean we could actually revert back to being an ordinary council, not a tier one council? Would it take us out of that that scenario? Uh, through the chair, I'd defer to David on that one, but I don't believe so. I think it's got other characteristics that aren't Locking tied to that. Perhaps and asking, but thank you. Yes, Tony's correct, um, Councillor. It's, it's, um, I don't think we're going to win that one, even under the current uh, scenario, just given the way it was written um, up. Uh, until there's new legislation, we at, at which time we might well argue the case to be a, a, a different, treated differently to Hamilton City. But at this stage, no, we're we're kind of lumped in because we're seen as part of that metro area. Yeah. Thank you, David. Okay, clear. Yeah. Um. Thanks. Uh, my question is about um, T11. Um, it's on page 181 of our agenda. It's it's to do with the MHUD or Kainga Aura development that's part of that T11. I'd just really like an update on how that's going because I have noticed uh, in the media that quite a, a number of other Kainga Aura projects have actually failed and aren't going to proceed now here. So it'd be really good to know whether or not it's likely that this one will actually get over the line. Uh, okay. Yes, yeah, so through the chair. So um, there's two parts to this um, MHUD land in Kainga Aura. So the um, MHUD portion is tied to the current developer that's in there um, that's got a 77 lot subdivision. So of that, there's 20 lots that are being bought online as underwrite, which means they can be restricted at a certain sale price. That's the requirement from MHUD in terms of lodging those and enabling that. Uh, the second component, oh, sorry, just to say where that status is, that's currently under development now. Uh, it's looking to be, um, if their construction goes well, it would be October that they'll be applying to do four. Um, and that, that would unlock, um, unlock those. They've got certain requirements from NHUB to have it all sorted by March and have those properties listed by March next year. So um, that's the first component. The second component of the KO block, uh, we had a meeting with them last Thursday uh, to cover off some of the issues that they've got on site with regards to stormwater. So we're working out with them an appropriate way forward to um, use the surplus land that we've got available and developing that site um, for, for purposes of either development or on sale, um, those types of means, but would look to combine their stormwater requirements with ours. Um, so at the moment, we're going through an information sourcing of what they've got on file. That's being collaborated through a consultant and we're working to size that appropriately. Uh, the intent would be that that gets delivered. Um, we're not sure what time frame they've got for delivery, but the, the main thing will be getting a consent in with the right density that they require to get that um, off the line. And that requires the stormwater to be solved in order to lodge that consent with that density. Thanks, that's really encouraging, actually. Please to that update. Madam Chair, can I, when we're talking about M Hood, could I just ask yep, a supplementary sure. on that to, before, we'll go to Philip. seeing as we're on M yeah. Hood? Uh, talking about M Hood development, there is a large land block in Cambridge North that's M Hood and designated for future development. Have we had any progress from M Hood on that block of land, please? Yes, so um, that. Project got put on ice. Oh, sorry, through the chair. Um, that that project got put on ice uh, due to resourcing at MHUD. Um, so they basically put it on hold. Um, I believe it was August, September last year, due to a staffing shortage that they had in order to supply that tender process. My understanding that tender process is re picked up. So I think in July we will likely hear a bit more from the successful tender process. I believe they narrowed it down to a tender list of four. I'm not sure who's on that tender list. It's all pretty behind closed doors, although we do have uh, requirements of that tender process to utilise our panel members um, regarding urban design. Uh, so I believe uh, Becca are on that panel with Annette Jones being requested for that. 
Um, so they will be reviewing each of the applications that come in. Uh, by July, we should have that sort of known entity of who's won that tender process, and then they'll look to lodge a subdivision application following that. Thank you for that, because there are some rumours floating around that are contrary to that, so it's really good to hear uh, that there is a, a known progress with that, even though it might be a concern as to what eventuates in that area. Good, thank you. Okay, Roger. Philip? Yeah, thank you. Just following on for Roger's comment about solar farms, I heard um, on the radio coming over here today that there was a large farm up in Northland that's opening this week. It's got 61,000 panels and there's three in the South Island. Do you, do you, have you heard how many panels this one here is likely to have? Oh, Jeff. Uh, no, I, I don't have the full answer for that one. Um, their pre-application was for one block of land. I, I'm not too sure how much percentage of that block they were looking to utilise as the solar farm. A little yep. quick research, see if I can find out how big that farm is up north. Yep. All right, Thank are there any, any other questions? Bruce. Thank you, Liz. Um, just uh, with the Environment Court appeal on the kiwi fruit orchard in Parallel Road, is any update on that? They said they're getting, they, they didn't, at true mediation, there was no resolution. Subsequent discussions say that it's hopeful they don't have to have a, a court hearing. Is there any updates on that? That's from November last year. Uh, through the chair, uh, I don't believe that's been resolved um, as of yet. I believe they're trying to settle it before going to the, the next level of, of court. Um, whether or not that's successful, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but we can follow up and get something through the Friday mail out to, to give a more confirmed update on that one. Mike. Yeah, through the chair, just a comment really, but reading through this report, one of the standouts was the consents percentage wise massively down in the in in the the amount of money not spent this year compared with last year is is so far down. So yeah, there's obviously some clear hurt through this data in our building industry out there. And I guess that drops into risk for us in terms of consents, a big part of our revenue. So um I guess it's obviously something we need to be aware of. Do we do anything to sort of, um, in the business area of WIPA or the building area, do we meet with the builders and just every now and again just to get a gauge of how things are going or is it just more ad hoc through individual developers or developers and builders? Uh, through the chair, I'll defer that one to Carl, but I can't see him on there in terms of they do a regular catch up with the builders. We uh, tend to do one with developers um, ad hocly um, yeah. to see where things are at in the market. But in terms of the buildings, um, I've got Carl's back online now, so I'll defer to him. Yeah, through the chair. So um, that's a plan for the new year, well, the new year that has started. Um, we've had quite a change in the leadership of our building um, compliance unit. So that is on our agenda is to start having regular catch ups with the key stakeholders. Um, but uh, we're well aware of who our who our major players are in terms of number of consents, et cetera, and we are in contact with them fairly regularly. Yeah, right. it's good to hear, Carl. Yeah, I mean, developers are one thing. The builders, you know, they're another too. So, yeah, good to hear it's happening. Andrew. Thanks, Liz. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm just on the same building consents, and obviously new dwellings are well down. Um but I, I noticed that um, we've got transportable dwellings and um, recited dwellings, and particularly in um, October, 15 recited dwellings seems a lot. So would I be right in assuming that they all have separate titles? And, you know, I, I have no comparison with previous years on that and wonder if that's a, an up-down or... B A B A U. So, so through the chair, I, I believe, um, depending on the size, it's a permitted activity to have a, a dwelling um, on it, a minor dwelling on your property. So those transportable ones are largely that, that smaller dwelling size, as long as they don't breach any of the other district plan rules around impervious area um, or anything else that sort of would trigger that land use. They, they don't trigger any of those discretionary items that are in the district plan. Therefore, we have seen an uptrend in smaller 
dwellings being placed that hold a supplementary person within them. Yeah. But they do attract a suit, don't they? They uh, through the chair, they they still attract a DC. Uh, it's just if it's under seventy square meters, it's 0. 0.5 of an HEU, not a full one. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on this item? No more. Okay. So we do have a um, a recommendation on page one hundred and forty three. 143 to receive the report. Move in a second. So Michael, move. Andrew will second. All in favour? Against. Carried. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, David. Thanks, Carl. Yeah. See you later. Okay, next item is our draft dangerous, affected and insanitary building policy for adoption. This is a good day, isn't it, when you see the word for adoption on there. <laughs> so welcome Melanie and I'll hand the item over to you. Oh just pop your button on sorry yeah. Can you hear me? Excellent. Yep perfect. Kia ora. I would like to take this report as read I'm highlighting a few key points. Uh, the purpose of, the is, of this report is to present the submissions from the dangerous affected in sanitary buildings policy and to seek adoption of the policy. Um, the background, um, the policy um, is to be reviewed every five years and it was last reviewed 2017. The policy states council's approach for performing its functions and priorities in relation to dangerous and sanitary and affected buildings and how the policy will apply to heritage buildings. The policy was reviewed last year, including two elected member workshops. As a result, minor changes were made to council's procedures and criteria for, cl for classifying buildings. The updated policy went out for consultation in November of last year and five submissions were received. All feedback either supported the updated policy or was out of scope. As a result, no updates have been made to the policy since it was last brought to elected members. And happy to take any questions. Thanks, Melanie. This has been on our kind of, you know, on our table for a wee while now. Mm. So really glad, yep. glad to see this day. I remember the first report. Maybe it was those great little pictures um, of really <laughs> odd-looking buildings that um, <laughs> made its way to us. Anyway, Roger, question. Yeah, and it's probably a cynical question, but I'm just looking in the submissions yep. and I see a submission there from Captain Nemo. Yep, yep. <laughs> Is that a real person? So I'm assuming I mean, that's a person. If it's a, uh, through the chair, I, I'm thinking that it was somebody who want, chose to be anonymous and wanted to have, have a little fun with it. Um, we've just displayed it as, as um, recorded in the submission. It takes a community, everybody. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so Marcus would like to, to move um, this recommendation. Lou is going to second it. So this is um, on page 238, eight, so A through to D. Okay, we've got a mover and a seconder. All in favour? No. Against? Carried. Great job, Melanie. Yep. All right, everybody, we'll move on to our next item, which is our economic development wellbeing strategy. So I'd like to welcome Joy, our new staff member, along with Kirsty. All right, over to you. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, morena, everybody. Kia ora koutou. Uh, you have in front of you for your information and update on where we're at in terms of progressing, progressing the economic wellbeing strategy. Uh, I'll take the report as read and open the floor to any questions. Fantastic. Okay, Claire, we'll start with you. Um, thank you, Joy. Um, great report, and I'm really pleased to see it here um, because I'm very interested in um, how this economic wellbeing strategy is going to be 
set out. I, I just had a look at um, the, the last page of your report on page 279 of our agenda, which sort of sets out the steps that you're proposing, yeah, to go forward. So it looked um, pretty fine to me. Um, what I was concerned about is there doesn't seem to be any input from elected members, um, like, you know, you're going to be working with, um, I guess, a, there's a, a steering group, and I, I thought there was a business stakeholder group as well, is likely to be involved. Um, so how do you see um, elected members having input into this as it's, as it's developed? Through you, Madam Chair, uh, there certainly is quite a bit of um, involvement from elected members, and that will be undertaken um, through the engagement process, which will be um, occurring in that, um, I think it's about the six box down, the implement the project plan. We do have a project plan around the project, and that's where it's included. Yeah. That's really reassuring. Yeah, thanks yeah. very much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right, thanks, Claire. Any other questions on the strategy? You've done a fantastic job. There we oh, go. Thank you. <laughs> and I, no, Susan, no, Susan's got something. No, yeah. no question. Just really excited to see this um, um, be uh, resurrected. It's sort of languished there for a bit as the timeline um, will sort of uh, set out. I do recall having some really excruciatingly painful online under lockdown mm -hmm. um, meetings with stakeholders, which is really not a great format to try and you know mm. and engage in a really meaningful level so look there are a lot of uh, there were hiccups along the way I guess so look I'm really excited to see this I think we'll all agree that um, economic stim um, economic development and stimulation of our economy is something that's uh, good for everyone and something that um, we um, we'd be really uh, excited to see progressed in a really uh, productive way so um, keep up the great work like look forward to seeing it unfold yes. Thanks, Susan. Okay, if there's no other queries, then uh, we have a recommendation on page 276 to receive the report. Claire's going to move and Dale Marie's going to second. All in favour? Aye. Carried. Well done, ladies. All right. Okay, we've got our... Uh, Submission to Waikato Regional Council, the Waikato Regional Land Transport Plan 2024 to 2054. Now, I don't see Rachel in the room. So let's just take a couple of minutes break, everybody. And we are cracking through our agenda this morning. So we are looking to potentially bring our workshops forward as well before lunch, if everyone's happy with that. Yeah. Please let me know if you feel like you need a break or if I'm moving too fast. But I feel, um, let, well, you're getting a break now. So take two or three minutes, stand up, do whatever you need to do. And when Rachel's here, I'll let you know.
Thank you, Zoe. All right. Okay, everybody, we've got our item, the submission to the Waikato Regional Council. This is on our Waikato Regional Land Transport Plan. So um, over to you, Rachel. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, and um, good morning, councillors. Um, just um, a heads up, um, you would have received the report, and I'll take it as being read. Um, there have obviously been a few changes in the last few days, um, and another one of those is that the draft GPS arrived yesterday, um, government policy statement on how we prioritise our funding. So... Um, I have spoken to the Regional Council this morning about what that means for the implications of that, and they are still getting their heads around what that actually means because that is quite a different um, policy direction than the previous government. So, um, so they will feed back any of that information through the Regional Advisory Group as to the direction that they think they should take through that. Um, but they did ask whether our council would like to present um, at the hearings. That wasn't included in the report, but if we feel that's an opportunity for us to say the implications of the government policy changes um, and the effects on Waipa District Council, they've asked if we would like that further, further opportunity to present at the hearings that are coming up on the 26th and 27th of March. Um, so I thought I would share that with you today and ask for any questions. Okay, thank you, uh, Rachel. So Claire and then Roger. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Um, really happy with what was um, in the um, submission and that, and I just love that opportunity to actually be able to um, have WIPA present uh, for the implications of the changes that are in the GPS, because, you know, transportation is, is such a massive part of what we do, and obviously the GPS is the way it gets funded. Uh, yeah, so I think I think that would be brilliant if we were able to take up that opportunity. Thanks, Claire. Okay, Roger. Yeah, thanks. And I, that was going to be my first question, is, uh, and when you, and I, I must admit, I've only scanned, read the draft um, government policy statement, and there are some really good positive things in there for us, you know, Cambridge Priory and the Southern Links within the, those 13 uh, road projects. So that's, that's good for us. But there's a lot of information there. For instance, the, the public transport inclusion. And they mentioned the allocation of resources into the major cities. But I can't read anything in there in terms of any of the allocations into the other tier one growth areas outside of those projects that, that are, they've identified. What concerns me is that if we're talking about a submission uh, in what is, what, three weeks' time? Three weeks' time? We yeah. can we talk yeah. about that? Yeah. Whether we'll then have sufficient information to be able to make a meaningful submission in terms of us as WIPA, um, do, do you think there will be any? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, they, they've just put out the draft. They'll say, well, submit to the draft. Mm. And so it's unlikely that we're going to get any real detailed information coming through in that time frame. Yeah, I mean, we can certainly. Thanks, Roger. Um, really good point. Um, it looks like public transport could be the major cities, Wellington, Auckland, um, but we don't know, as you say, what the implications are on that for our metro spatial plan, our local services as well. So that's certainly something we can raise through uh, attending the hearing, but obviously, and Cambridge Connections, um, yeah, obviously we've got those avenues to ask those important questions. Will we be able to ask those questions before the submission date? Um, we can certainly raise them through the regional advisory group as well um, that meet regularly um, and, and, and see whether we can get those answered. Okay. Happy with that? Or? Oh, yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah. Any other 
questions comments yeah. on this uh, item? Yeah, Andrew? yeah, sort of just following on from that. I mean, I just listened to the radio this morning. I haven't read this thing, but it seemed pretty clear that uh, public transport was going to be a pretty secondary um, issue for, for this government, you know, in, in terms of our region. And uh, yeah, it's a shame. I think there's still 6.2 billion being spent on public transport within the government policy statement. Yeah. So, I mean, that's I, that's a fair resource. Yeah. Surely but, there's going to be something in there that can be allocated to areas outside of those main centres. I hope so, Roger. I mean, the, the clear, what I heard was that um, uh, the ticket prices are going to go up and um, uh, quite, you know, quite clearly. Yeah. And... Um, and usage will be directly proportional, I suggest, that research is mm -hmm. shown. Yeah, as I say, we can we can aim to clarify that in the coming weeks, um, what that actually means for the Waikato. Um, yeah. OK. Claire's got her finger on the button. And oh, I wasn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just saying that, mm. yeah, I'm not surprised uh, that the main centres are the focus of the of central government for public transport, because they, they've had pretty clearly signalled that they see the best productivity gains uh, in those major centres. I, I, I think, yes, so buses and light rail are probably out for the Waikato, um, but there's other ways of um, addressing the problem, like I'm thinking rideshare is looking really good at the moment, yeah, which is something I've raised previously. It has the potential, actually, to get far more people um, away from individual cars than any bus could, you know, like um, the, the the statistics, you know, for bus use, I think Auckland, uh, Wellington's the best in, in New Zealand for only 17% of trips. Auckland is about 6 or 7% of trips, you know, so the investment that would be needed to get that up to 40 or 50% is absolutely phenomenal, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you, Claire. Any other comments on this item? No, if we're happy to, we've got a, a recommendation that we receive the report and approve the submission A and B on um, page 281. Roger, you'd like to move that, and Dale Marie would like to second that. All in favour? Aye. aye. Against? Yes. Carried. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody, what we're going to do is we're going to come back to our earlier item, which is our consultation of draft schedule of fees and charges, 2024-25. I believe we're ready to go. I think you've all received an email with an amendment. Now, there is an amendment to the recommendation as well, which um, we'll put up on the screen when the time comes. Right, so we have um, Melanie back with Yolanda. Right, I'll hand the item over to you both, thanks. Thank you. Good morning again, nice to see you all again. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. As uh, was just mentioned, um, there has been an updated schedule that has just been circulated. And as a result, the recommendations have been amended to reflect this. Um, would like to take the report as read, highlighting a few key points. Um, I will start off with more of the overall timeline and how things are progressing, and we'll hand it over to Yolanda for the financial side of things. Um, so the purpose of this report is to seek approval of the fees and charges um, statement of proposal and the draft schedule of fees and charges for consultation. Uh, the fees and charges timeline is now separate from the enhanced annual plan. Previously, we had been following along with a long-term plan, um, but in order for timeliness and to be able to have a full month of consultation, we've decided to decouple from the enhanced annual plan. The currently scheduled consultation timeframe is the 25th of March to 2026 of April. Um, and the schedule of fees and charges include all of council's proposed fees and charges for the 24-25 financial year, um, noting that we are now looking at a one-year time period as previously, um, which is a little different from what we previously discussed. Um, I will now hand it over to Yolanda for the financial side. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, so previously we've discussed the um, draft fees and charges schedule with, with you. Um, so just to reiterate, we started off with a blanket 10% increase on the charges. There were some exceptions. Some of the charges were higher than 10%. These were to align with market rates um, or regulatory fees. Um, also the Mighty River Domain camping and events rates increased the last uh, time these were updated was 2021. So those fees have been updated. Similarly, we also had increases of less than 10% where our current fees would um, that, that enable cost recovery already um, or where there were regulatory fees associated with those. Um, then on the changes to the document that was circulated, I could maybe just talk you through those, if that's okay. Yep. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so the first one is on um, your agenda, page 42. There's an hourly rate for a building compliance officer. Um, you will see that the 2425 column is empty. So that line we will we have deleted um, because those officers are charged at the same as a professional council officer. So it um, it will still be charged, it's just under a different line. Um, then on the dog registrations, um, sorry, just looking for it. Uh, there's on the description table, so that's page 48 of your agenda. In the description, there's rebates in brackets, so a 10, 15, and a 25. So if you start off with $101 for no rebates on the standard, and you deduct the $10, you get a different value to the $90 that you currently see. So that's 91. Um, and that's been updated. So all those um, charges have been updated in the document that was circulated to you. Similarly, on the penalty side, you will take the standard fee, the new standard fee, times um, 100, well, 150 to add the 50% to it. And then the last charge we removed is currently the document you have. Sorry, I just want to find it. Is a charge for faxing, um, but we don't really find clients um, using that facility anymore. So we will just remove, be removing the fax charge that is on page 40 of your agenda. So there's for New Zealand and international sending, both instances will be removed. Thank you, Jane. Thanks, Yolanda. Okay, uh, questions, we've got Roger. First. Oh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. I uh, understand the reason behind the overall general 10% that's applied throughout, but I just notice, if my maths are correct, that the cemetery fees for internments, Tiawamotu and Hautapu, have actually gone up 20%. Why have we felt the need to do that? It's a... That's a cost of dying, Bill, <laughs> not a cost of living. So I would just... Can I say that? <laughs> okay, I'm not too sure that the ladies in front will be able to answer that. Claire has an idea. Oh, no, Melissa has an has a, has a answer to that. Come and... Yes, you need a microphone, please. Thank you. Um, so through you, Madam Chair, the reason for um, that is to effectively incentivise um, interment of ashes or ashes as opposed to burials, noting that our cemetery capacity is um, at an absolute premium at the moment. Hmm. How much of an incentive would that be? I mean, if my, my thoughts are in the mind that somebody wants a casket burial, they probably want a casket burial, somebody wants to go up in ashes, then, you know, I'm just, I'm not too sure 
And I just think putting up a charge like that mm. to 20% is, I'm just worrying at the rationale at all. Yes, uh, so point noted, um, it is uh, one of our very limited tools in the toolbox that we can to drive behaviour. Um, so that's why um, the fee structure has been proposed as it is. Right, so let's remember this is a draft fees, so this will go out for consultation, so um, we'll allow our community to comment on on all the suggested or draft um, changes that there are, so perhaps, uh, yeah, that could be discussed at a later time when we come to look at all the submissions that we receive. Sally, is there anything else you wanted to say to this? Um, if I can, through the chair, I think um, Melissa has uh, responded very well. Um, it is only for hot topo and TA only, which we do have a, a, a limited capacity left within those cemeteries. And it is also looking at other opportunities we have across other sites, as you're aware of, through the work that we did with the cemetery development plans. Um, I think it would be good to get our community feedback on this um, and that there is also other mechanisms within those fees and charges to try and um, look at those opportunities for burial options for our community and do agree um, with what Councillor Roger had see has said. Uh, essentially, if people want to be buried, they will look at those options to be buried versus cremated, um, but there is a shift in terms of cremations being higher at the moment due to those ongoing costs. All righty. Thanks, Sally, for that. Mike. Sorry, through the chair. Um, on page 23 of the document or page... Uh, what is it? Page... Um, anyway, page 23 of the 52. And just in those other charges, and just looking at some of the disparities there, um, traffic management boards. So that's gone up like 350% from 40 to 180 just to some of that stuff there, there's a few of them in there. One's gone from 225 to 400, 107 to 150. They're just sort of out of proportion of some of the other increases. So it's on page 24 of our report. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, 59. 59, is it? Sorry, 59. Page 59, everyone have a wee look at that. Yeah, the power supplies things are all the same. It's just the, the water use has gone up to a 10% odd. <laughs> I can probably answer that right. for you. All right. It doesn't feel too uncomfortable for everybody. Uh, so this is an, the, the traffic management um, and electronic boards are a brand. We've completely changed systems. So our old system was putting out signs. Our new systems we have, we actually have VMS boards. So they are new, they're going to be, um, at the moment we're hiring them, they're going to be new purchases. So this is something new, it's very, so the heading is the same, but it's a completely new system. Right, all right, yep, no, thanks for that. Any other queries? Okay, right, so we, we have a new recommendation, I think, Joe. If you're ready, we'll pop that on the board. And so just reminding everyone, this is, yeah, there's a draft. We'll let our community have their say. We'll see the submissions and we'll adopt, obviously, at a later time. All right. So we've got... Can everyone read that? Do, does anyone want me to, to, to say it out loud? Yeah, so just updating the... Uh, Acknowledging the updates that have been tabled this morning. Okay, so the recommendation is on page 30. Um, I'm, I think I'm here. Susan will go, we'll move the recommendation with its changes. Roger's happy to second the recommendation. All in favour? Against? Carried. All right, everybody, that brings us to the conclusion of this meeting. So we will ask Dalmarie to... Karakia, us. Thank you. Kia tau te mauri, kia tau te aroha, kia tau te whakaaro mo tēnei kaupapa i tēnei rangi. Uh, tuturu whakamaua kia tēna, tēna. Haumie, huie, tāi. Kia. Kia. kia ora tātou. Thank you both.
So we have ask, a... we've, we've got out of the habit of explaining in English because my Tereo, unfortunately, is sorry, <laughs> in English, <coughs> strive hard with your with the oh. other language. So, what I basically said was bring it all together, release it all, let's move on with our day. It's, mine is usually very non-denominational because I oh. don't want to bring in all the religions, so I just keep it non-denominational. So, yeah. tēnā Thank you, Dale Marie. Philip. Yeah, just just on there, um, really good. enjoying having Dale about. Um, uh, this morning she explained what the Karakir spent, sent, said this morning that helped me decide on the Memorial Park motion um, and also some of the events that we've been attending, uh, iwi events we've been attending. You know, I've been wondering what the heck they're about. So it's been fantastic having Dale around, being able to explain that and understand it rather than just turning up. So it's been really good. So thanks. Thanks, Philip. Okay, so we're going to move on to our workshops. Um, we have two, first of all, a verbal update on um, Ahuaki. We have um, Vanessa and Kirsty here, and we'll continue on with our budgeting process, closed workshop at 11.30. So we've got some slight changes, and then we'll conclude the day with lunch. So I will pass over now to uh, Vanessa and Kirsty. Oh, um, hope you'll well and um, moved on from the the uh, partners workshop that we held a couple of weeks ago. Now, um, here to provide a, a a quick verbal update, and that is very much following on the decision that was made early um, this morning. Um, so as you know, and as way of background, um, we had made the decision um, a few months ago, I think back in November 2023, to align the long-term plan and um, Ahuake um, special consultative procedure. And that was really to reinforce the strategic narrative, but also to actually uh, um, communicate the interdependency between those two key strategic projects. Um, following the decision was being made this morning of going up ahead with an uh, enhanced annual plan um, and to defer obviously the long term plan as well to your 24 um, to your 25 34 um, time frames. Um, we had to rethink the um, SCP, the special consultative procedure approach, because we can't actually uh, uh, align them um, anymore. As you know, um, and contextually, the LTP provides a mechanism of implementation to um, Ahuake, and there is actually a significant strategic link between um, both implementation of both um, projects, and that needs to be actually well communicated to partners, to stakeholders, and to the wider community. And um, as the Ahuake has been actually set up, the LTP um, provide um, for the, the first part, or in part provide for the first um, 10 years of investment for um, Ahuake. That's how actually the operationalization of Ahuake has been actually set up in the implementation plan. Um, on the back of this, we received some technical advice from Ian Munro, who is not only the um, independent reviewer for um, the project, but has also actually provided multiple technical advice to um, council when it comes about planning, but also about um, spatial planning or, or um, structure planning as well. So in accordance to this, um, and to ensure um, that we actually maintain the momentum um, of engagement with, that we've built over the last kind of three years with partners, with stakeholders, and with the wider community, and also to um, reinforce the alignment um, with the, the, the deferred um, LTP. Um, we have decided, so if you want to give us um, we have um, decided to look at potentially decoupling 
the strategy and its implementation plan. Um, and mid-March, we will have um, a meeting with our project control group and the recommendation will be put forward to them um, for this to actually be endorsed. Um, and the decoupling is really for the purpose of a special consultative procedure, which is now scheduled um, for um, mid June 2024. So that is really to um, to allow for the engagement to be carried forward, um, while we retain a level of alignment with the differed LTP. The, we need to show a level of commitment while we will be actually putting the strategy document to consultation to the wider community. We need to ensure that we also provide a level of commitment to that strategy. And a way to actually do that will be to present at the same time a draft implementation plan so that the strategy doesn't go on its own and is not just taken as an aspirational document, but if we actually provide a draft implementation plan next to it, we are actually committing ourselves to a time frames, but also to a level of intervention um, to, to uh, be maintained uh, uh, on the side of our strategy. And that is really to kind of, that is that commitment to Ahuaki benefit delivery. Um, so we will be, um, so while the strategy will be put to be SCP in June 2024, we intend for the implementation plan to be put for SCP as well in alignment with the deferred LTP, which is indicatively scheduled, as I understand, March. Of March and April of 2025. Yeah. So we will actually put the implementation plan of Ahuaki in alignment with the LTP. And that's again about reinforcing that strategic narrative around those two um, kind of projects um, as well. So the implementation plan will also go for its own kind of SCP, but it will be at a separate time than the strategy. And that means that we can also update the um, implementation plan um, and we can ensure that it is in full alignment. We know it is currently, but just in, with all the changes that have actually occurred over, over the last kind of few months, we need to ensure that this alignment continue in the in the 2534 timeframes. The SCP uh, for the strategy section, the strategy part, um, is indicatively scheduled for the 14th of June. So we're currently working um, our timeframes around this. And we will be seeking approval from Council on the strategy again around September 2024. Okay. Yeah. Great. Monty. Um, thanks for that. The, I just want to question you about the draft implementation plan that will be um, accompanying the mm -hmm. SCP in June. What kind of level of detail are you thinking about in there? Because this kind of worries me, just, just that aspect. Mm -hmm. If you get too far ahead of LTP deliberations for the following year. Yeah, and you're absolutely correct. Um, there is actually uh, uh, really a middle ground to strike here. The document that was actually shared with partners at the workshop on the 23rd will obviously need to be amended slightly because there is quite a level of detail when it comes to uh, the implementation. So I think it's really about noting the who, the when, the how. So the time frame scale needs to be uh, um, needs to be retained. I think the method of implementation and the the guidance on on uh, implementation probably will need to be left out for that implementation plan. So we will still need to look at um, why we're doing this, how we intend to do this, and the, the management frameworks that needs to be actually set up along those sides. We will also actually name the different intervention because they are very much linked with the, the future opportunities which are have been identified in the documents and how we actually realize those opportunities. 
and the, 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 the method of implementation, so the tools that will need to be used to implement each of those interventions, and the, the, um, the level of, uh, of specificity probably will need to be left up for, for that implementation plan. And that is something that will be recaptured when we actually put the implementation plan itself for the SCP. And did you say the timing was going to be in or out of that draft? I think we probably should have it. I think there's no much discussion what has been happening at this stage mm -hmm. as to um, where and when. We can provide some indication as a time frame. I but. think um, it's certainly we need to be indicating whether it's short, medium or long yes. term, but not specifics yeah. in terms yeah. of financial year yeah. delivery. And I think that's what we did in the draft yeah. document as it is right now. We're only talking about short, medium or long term um, interventions. Yeah, yeah great. That, that fits with my conception of mm. spatial planning and I can live with those time frames because you're not even really time bounding them. So. No. Cool, thank no. you. And, and again, we just need to remember that Ahuake is set to have a very adaptive way of, of managing the prioritization that is handled and, and under its, its um, delivery. Um, you know, we need to look at KPIs, we need to look to uh, key performance indicators, and based on that, so it needs to be really remaining evidence-based, based on that, uh, uh, we need to retain that adaptation around what needs to be delivered in the next term. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, Monty. Claire? Yeah, thanks. I just want to say, firstly, that that partners workshop, I thought, was really valuable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and thanks for all the work that went into it. Yeah. Yeah. I was pleased, yeah, to be part of it. Yeah. Um, so I'm... I've got two two main questions to do with your um, presentation today. The first is around the implementation plan, and obviously Monty's question has clarified some stuff. But I just will there be messaging that the the long term plan process, which is then going to happen in the next you know six six months going forward from when you're doing this special consultation process will probably be the time where those plans are crystallised, are sort of given more clarity and, and um, more certainty as to when they'll actually be funded. Mm -hmm. You're not trying to do that during that consultation period, are you? Uh, no. No, 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 absolutely yeah, not. Yeah, no, no, you're giving no. indications, it, like, like yeah. at that partner's workshop, that, that plan that's there. And no, when, yeah, no, yeah, no. Yeah. And again, the document that you've seen on the 23rd mm. of February probably mm. will need to be amended oh, too, yeah. so that we can start looking at a distinct term between the strategy document mm -hmm. and the yeah. implementation document. Yeah. Yeah. And we some of the, the interweaving kind of... Uh, um, um, content that we had probably needs to be bring back a little bit just so that we have a really clear document to go to the wider community yeah, yeah. and we don't actually um, mess things up when we receive submissions as well because yeah. we need to be really clear about what submissions are on the strategy and what submissions will be done on yeah. the implementation as well. So we still need to have a little bit of work within the project team to kind of understand how we're going to manage mm. um, this um, post-SCP period. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then my last question is, is more a personal thing. So the consultation process, a month starting on the 14th of June. So does this mean that councillors aren't having their slow July and no, mm -hmm. no meetings in July? I mean, I was kind of hoping if we adopted that... <laughs> enhance annual plan, yeah, that we'd get that that uh, July break back again. So is that is that not a isn't that not on the case? Oh, I mean, okay. no. <laughs> I'm sorry. But... <laughs> You're going overseas. <laughs> oh, sorry. Over to Kirsty. Yeah, so so what elected members are asking is do they forego their um, dry July, their no meeting July? Um, I, don't, I don't think that we're able to, to say that. Um, I think the intention is still that um, acknowledge that people have still made commit, have made commitments. Um, the intention is that, look, we can't bring it forward um, to align with the enhanced annual plan time frame. And similarly, we can't push it out any further because we need to be able to progress to a point where it can provide 
direction to the development of the next long-term plan and align with that. So this is kind of the best of the situation, really. Um, in terms of the, the what that looks like, we're working with Lisa um, around that. Um, yes, we would hope that there would be some involvement from elected members, but, um, you know, that could be at the front end. And... Um, and, you know, um, I guess while we are encouraging people to participate in the process, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we're still working through what, what that's going to look like and we'll communicate that to you through the PCG and through updates to the SPMP committee. And just to be clear, I don't think we are looking to have any extraordinary meeting in July no. at all. We will probably be processing a lot <laughs> from the 14th of July. Um, onwards, and mm. I think the first meeting that I, I'm actually starting to inquire with governance is the second week of August. So, yeah. the, just so that you also have some level of comfort, we, you know, when we were looking at a time frame for LTP of adoption by end of September, when that mm. was looking likely, there were some indicative timings for uh, for hearings deliberations. So, we're trying to align with that. Okay. All righty. Any other queries? No? Brilliant. Thank you both. All right. If you need to 